Okay, so finally, it's also my pleasure to introduce uh, Julian Colombelli, who will be uh, in charge uh, jointly with uh, Maria Calvo uh, to, to chair, uh, will be in charge of chairing the, the, the first session of the, of the meeting. So let's go. Thank you very much. Thanks, Renato. So I, I join everyone to, um, to basically say it was very exciting to organize this meeting. And I just want to like pass on like two very brief messages. First, like thanks to the sponsors uh, who have actually made this meeting uh, possible and, uh, and also possible that we wouldn't do it on Skype. Like, so we have a bit more means to organize it properly. And uh, the second message is that this meeting is also supported by um, a Spanish project uh, of Network of Excellence called uh, Bioimaging Spain. And uh, if you want to know more about this, uh, this would be somehow introduced by Timo Timmerman during the workshop two in the afternoon at five o'clock. So it's my pleasure to start the first session uh, about uh, advanced bioimaging in cell biology. So our first speaker is uh, Xavier Trepat. So uh, Xavier Trepat is a IQF professor at the IBEC, the Institute of Bioengineering in Catalonia. He's a physicist and engineer. He obtained his PhD at the medical school at the University of Barcelona. And then after a postdoc at the Harvard University, he basically came back to, uh, to Barcelona and he's a professor since uh, 2011. He's been um, doing amazing research at the interface between physics and biology, uh, studying cytoskeletal mechanics, um, uh, cell migration, uh, cancer, 2D, 3D, etc. So we're very much looking forward to your talk, Javi. Thank you. You're mute, I think. Okay, can, can you hear me now? Yes. And can you see my slides? Yes. Perfect. Okay, well, thank you, Julian, for the introduction. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me here. I'm really delighted to kick off this session on advanced uh, imaging. I have to disclose that I never considered myself an expert in advanced imaging. Uh, we do imaging, uh, we combine it with uh, other technologies. Uh, and I'm certainly interested in hearing feedback from, from, from this community. Um, so I'll tell you today about uh, some recent developments in my lab uh, on the mechanobiology of intestinal organelles. So we're interested in general in epithelial tissues, which as I'm sure you know, are layers of cells, thin layers of cells that cover internal and external surfaces of our body. Epithelia can come in many different flavors and shapes. Uh, in the simplest of these flavors, it's just one monolayer of cells that is tightly packed, connected through different types of junctions, such as side junctions, address junctions, or desmosomes. And they are usually sitting on top of a <clears throat> complex hydrogel called the extracellular matrix. Now, despite the fact that epithelia account for a very small fraction of the mass uh, of your body, they play a number of fundamental roles that include tissue compartmentalization. They're also responsible for uh, protection against pathogens. And that's why we hear about them extensively these days. Uh, they drive many morphogenetic movements. They are responsible for secretion trans and transport of uh, fluids, ions, uh, macromolecules. They drive uh, wound healing to some extent. And unfortunately, they are also responsible for about 80% of all cancers. Now, each of these functions is mediated by mechanobiology, which is the interplay between mechanics and biology. Um, so to begin illustrating what I mean by mechanobiology and the way we studied, I would like to begin with uh, a classical example uh, in, in tissue biology which is uh, the case of wound healing. So this is an example of an experiment that you could run 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, or even a century ago, uh, in which you start with a monolayer of cells, you scratch it with a pipette tip, or you wound it with uh, Julian's lasers, as we did here, and you just watch what happens. And what happens is that cells seal the wound, in this case, within the course of a bit more uh, than uh, an hour. So some time ago, we decided to revisit this problem. And uh, as soon as we started thinking about this problem, we realized that we could not understand it without having access to the mechanics of this problem. Uh, 
In other words, we needed to know what are the forces that cells are exerting on their neighbors and on their underlying substrate in order to heal these wounds. So for this reason and many others, we spent a substantial effort in developing technologies that would allow us to visualize these forces. One of the technologies that I will be telling you today about is uh, traction microscopy, which is illustrated here. It's a very simple technique from a conceptual point of view. So you have here a mon monolayer of cells that is moving in this direction and is sitting on top of a soft elastic substrate. Now, the idea is that when these cells move, they generate forces on their underlying substrate to direct connection. Uh, now, if these forces are high enough and the gel under, underneath is soft enough, then these forces will be sufficient to deform the gel. We can measure the deformation of the substrate by embedding fluorescent particles. We can track directly the motion of these particles, or we can run PAV uh, algorithms in order to, to, to map those deformations. So once we have the deformations of the substrate, we can solve an inverse problem in continuum mechanics uh, that gives us on a pixel by pixel basis, a map of the forces that cells are exerting. So with this, we can, oh, so uh, we, we, if you're interested in this type of technologies, I will not have time to give you details. We wrote uh, recently a review of not only this technology, but many other technologies that have been developed uh, in the past uh, decade or so in order to map uh, mechanical forces in, in tissue. Um, so now with this technology, we can now turn uh, a movie like this one into one that uh, looks uh, uh, like this, in which we now have uh, on a pixel by pixel basis, a map of how much force these cells are exerting on their underlying substrate. Now these tractions, these, these forces are called traction forces and they are color coded here according to the sign of the radial component. In other words, forces that are pointing away from the wound are labeled in red Forces that are pointing towards the wound are labeled in green. If you pay close attention to this movie, we'll notice that there's a transition between forces that are predominantly red at the beginning of uh, this process to forces that are predominantly green at the end. This reflects two different mechanisms. Red forces, red vectors, uh, correspond to crawling forces. These are cells that are actively migrating towards the wound. Uh, green forces, uh, are a consequence of the assembly of a contractor ring at the periphery of this wound. The contraction of this ring drags cells forward, resulting in forces that point inward. Um, now, once we had mapped uh, these forces, uh, both in, in time and space, and we were able to develop models, uh, vertex models in this case, in which we were able to uh, uh, introduce crawling forces, through a millipodia, you can see here in red as well as this contractor ring. So then we can go back and forth uh, from data to experiment, uh, to, to models, uh, and then uh, really uh, discern what mechanisms are at play and what's the relative contribution. So now this is uh, published data, but I still wanted to begin with this because I think it illustrates how we work in the lab. We try to make forces visible in many different problems in tissue biology, and then by combining data and modeling, uh, we end up learning about uh, mechanisms that drive uh, those processes. Now, one important process in epithelial mechanobiology is the problem of epithelial folders. Uh, epithelia in general are not flat, they are folded. And there's different mechanisms that have been uh, proposed uh, to explain uh, that process. One of them is very well known, this is a drosophila embryo, uh, which uh, during gastrulation invaginate, and invagination here is driven by bending through myosin differential. As you're seeing myosin here, uh, it accumulates at the apical surface uh, of the cells and the contraction uh, of the cells drives uh, invagination in this case. So this is uh, a bending moment that arises from myosin differential. But there are other mechanisms that can give rise to folding. So one of them is, for example, buckling. Um, this is data recently published by Guillaume Charasso's lab where they hold a suspended monolayer in between two cantilevers. When they bring together the two cantilevers, then the monolayer that is sitting on top of them uh, actually buckles. So this is another mechanism uh, for, uh, for folding. Uh, so buckling can come from the application of external stresses, but it can also come from, uh, from self-generated stresses, in this case, compressive stresses that derive from growth. Uh, this is data from Mogalien Wood's lab, where they grow epithelia inside uh, alginate capsules that you see here in, in, in blue. Uh, so these monolayers grow, and at some point they reach uh, such a compressive stress as a consequence of growth 
that causes the moon layer to be laminate through a buckling uh, mechanism. So here's another mechanism uh, for, uh, for, for, for folding uh, that is different from bending and is different from this case. Finally, there's another mechanism that uh, we worked on in, in the lab in this, in this paper uh, by PhD student Ernest Latore. Uh, it's important to always keep in mind that epithelial professionals are uh, transporting ions. And if you can transport ions, then you can control osmotic pressure. And there is no better force, or there's no stronger force than the one you can generate by driving flows. So uh, this is what drives uh, folding in this monoria is actually controlling the water flow across the epithelial layer. So these are four different mechanisms that can give rise to epithelial folding, and I will be discussing them uh, later on. Okay, so uh, the, the, the main theme of my talk today is uh, the intestinal epithelium. And this is work by two PhD students, Carlos and Gerardo, in collaboration with Daniela Abinevic at Curie and Marino Arroyo at the UTC on the theory side. You can tweet it uh, in the bioarchive, and I forgot to say that you can tweet about anything that you see. In fact, you can find uh, an extended version of this talk on YouTube. So I think it's time for open science. So for us, it's okay uh, if, you, if, you, if you post about this. Um, so intestinal epithelium is shaped uh, according to these finger-like protrusions that are called villi. Their purpose is to pack a very large surface into very small volumes in order to, uh, uh, to, to maximize absorption of uh, nutrients and fluids. And this is a tissue that uh, has the record of being the fastest self-renewing tissue in our body. Um, um, so you probably know, and if you, and if you don't, it, it's an interesting uh, data that uh, uh, the entire surface of your intestine is renewed every three to five days. And the way this surface is renewed is through the action of stem cells that resides in invaginations that are called the crypts and that are located in between uh, the villi. You can see them here. Now, the stem cells residing at the bottom of this crypt, they, co they coexist with panel cells, which are secretory cells. Stem cells here, they divide, they move to this transit amplifying zone where they divide even further, and then they start migrating all the way towards the tip of the villus where they die. So they go from stem cell, they undergo pro progressive rather division as well as the fertilization, and eventually they die. So in their journey from the bottom of the crypt to the tip of the villus, which lasts three to five days, these cells must be able to perform the following core biological functions, stemness, compartmentalization, folding, proliferation, migration, differentiation, and death. Now, these are not anecdotal functions in cell biology, right? So these are uh, core functions as entire conferences devoted to each one of these functions. So the question that we wanted to ask is how are these functions coordinated in this tissue? And to what extent mechanics plays a role in that coordination? So you cannot address this question in vivo because you don't have access to the mammalian uh, uh, intestine in vivo with sufficient resolution, of course. Um, but uh, thankfully, over the past decade, there's been the revolution of organelles, and we learned that you can take one single stem cell from this tissue, and if you provide it with the right physical chemical environment, then uh, you can grow an organoid, which in its simplest form uh, looks like this. So it's a folded epithelial monolayer that has some crypt-like domains that contain stem cells and panel cells, and some villus-like domains that contain differentiated cells that are extruded into the lumen. So this, uh, these uh, systems uh, look like this. And of course, uh, these organoids are not the real thing. But to some extent, these organoids, they recapitulate uh, each of these functions. It's an interesting, accessible uh, model in order to study the mechanobiology of, uh, of this system. Now, in the way we like to do mechanobiology, we like to be able to measure uh, with sufficient single cell resolution the forces that one cell generates on the neighbors and on the surrounding matrix. This is something you cannot do in 3D. There's no technology that would allow you to do that uh, in 3D. So we decided to develop our own forms of organoids, which uh, work uh, as I'm showing in this slide. So we begin with three-dimensional organoids. Then we chop it. We, we chop these organoids into different pieces. Then we throw these pieces on top of uh, soft polyacrylamide gels that are coated with collagen one and laminin, and that contains beads in order to measure those forces. Now, we discovered that if you wait long enough, then this system self-assembles and forms one monolayer organoid. Uh, I can show you uh, th this process in this movie. This is uh, uh, right after, a uh, few hours after uh, dropping these pieces of organoids on top of the gel. Now, notice that uh, when 
you watch the cells do whatever they want to do over the course of a couple of, of days, what you find is that uh, they self-organize, they, they cover the entire surface of this uh, of this uh, of this gel, and they end up uh, forming uh, sort of two types of, of, of areas, right? One in which you have this differentiated cuboidal epithelium that you can see here, and then in this red circle you can observe a more complicated uh, structure that we decided to study in detail. So when you focus on this structure with higher magnification, then what you observe is something that looks like this. Now this looks like a projection of a confocal star, but it's actually not a projection of a star. It is one plane, one confocal plane. And uh, but just looking at the shape of the cells uh, of this medial confocal plane of the tissue, you can immediately tell that there are different cell types. So what we did first, of course, is to just uh, take uh, the usual uh, reagents in order to identify what is uh, the nature of each one of these cell types. And what we found, for example, that in this central area of highly packed cells, this is where stem cells reside, as labeled here with LGR5. And here's also where these uh, panel cells exist, as marked here with lysozymes. Now, this central area contains only uh, uh, panel cells and stem cells, so this is a stem cell niche. Uh, and right after this uh, stem cell niche, what we find is uh, cells that are positive for cytokeratin 20, uh, and uh, cytokeratin 20 is a marker for differentiated cells. So this and a lot of more data that I'm not uh, showing you today told us that uh, these two-dimensional organoids they retain all the relevant cell types that are present in the intestinal epithelium. And it also retains the right zonation of this uh, tissue. And not only that, it actually also retains the function of this, of this tissue. Because this is, in fact, the first snapshot of a movie. If I now play the movie, you will uh, notice, if you actually watch it several times, that cells at the niche, they are divided. They are moving away from the niche, where they proliferate heavily. And eventually they increase the spread. And when they reach this area of very, very spread cells, uh, here is where cells are extruded and uh, into, the, into the, the lumen. So this really recapitulates this axis that I was mentioning uh, earlier on. You can appreciate better this extrusion phenomenon here. If I take now a, a higher plane, a higher co co confocal plane. So if you look apically, then you see all these cells that are extruded in this area uh, of highly, highly spread cells. I can also show you a movie with higher spatial and temporal resolution, where you can appreciate better, for example, the rounding up of cells uh, at the stem cell niche and beyond. You can also appreciate uh, the movement of cells uh, that are leaving the niche and migrating away towards this virus like area. So we call this the 2D crypt, which is an oxymoron because you cannot be a crypt in 2D. But uh, we like to call it 2D crypt because it highlights a, 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 a really uh, paradoxical fact, which is that uh, these cells retain many of the identity, zonation, and function of the tissue in, uh, in, in, in the actual in vivo, in vivo case. And to me, this was really surprising uh, because it goes against the way that I thought about uh, tissue biology and tissue engineering which is that if you want to recapitulate how a tissue uh, works in vivo, you need to provide it with the right conditions in terms of 3D geometry, in terms of the right extracellular matrix, in terms of stiffness, in terms of density of the ligands, the right ligands, the right signals, the right even stromal cells. Yeah. And, and none of this happens here, right? Here we're doing all the wrong things. We're just chopping organoids, dumping them on top of a flat surface, and that is sufficient, and these guys just self-organized and they do what they are supposed to do in vivo. So this was to me really revolution, revolutionizing the way uh, I thought about this uh, tissue biology and tissue engineering. So what uh, this led us to is to really think hard about what is the link between what I call the four apps, which is form, function, fate, and force. And uh, I will not have time to tell you about all this, uh, but I would like to tell you a bit what we discovered by, by, by measuring forces and analyzing those, those measurements. And this work that Gerardo and Carlos did with Manu Gomez uh, in the lab, who's an engineer who uh, developed many of the techniques that I'm talking about today. So this is a map of uh, the system in which uh, we now map in 3D, the four that cells that you have under underlying substrate. So representing 3D, uh, vector map is complicated. So what we're doing here is we're representing the x, y uh, forces with these yellow vectors. And then we're color coding the third dimension uh, with this color map where 
blue is forces that push uh, in the direction of the screen, like towards the screen, and red is forces away from the screen. Uh, so what we're able to see is that at the center of this stems and niche, uh, these uh, XY forces are zero. Then they increase as you go to this transit amplifying zone, they vanish and then they invert their sign. The normal component is pushing in the stem cell niche. So cells, stem cells are sort of pushing towards the substrate, whereas the transit amplifying zone where cells are dividing, it actually pulls away from the substrate. So this is a 3D view of what I just, what I, what I just said. So what this tells you is there is a very close co-localization between mechanical and functional confinement in the system that we decided to study further. Uh, we can record movies of this, uh, which uh, show you that uh, indeed this is a very uh, solid and stable uh, pattern in which you have this stem cell need that is continuously pushing towards the substrate. The transit amplifying zone is continuously pulling away from the substrate. And then these cells that in the virus like domain, then they are uh, fluctuating uh, heavily, as we have observed with other epithelial differentiated uh, epithelium. Now, here's a side view of the same. Uh, that is probably more intuitive, where you can see here the stem cell need. You can see some many cell divisions, the cells that are popping out of the monolayer transiently. So stem cells are pushing towards the substrate, transit amplifying zones are pulling uh, away from the substrate. So the mechanics of this problem is not simple, it's actually complicated with non monotonic variations of all the different traction components. Um, but uh, there's one really uh, straightforward uh, result here, which is that if the stem cell niche is pushing and the transit amplifying zone is pulling, what this model layer is trying to do is it's trying to bend. It's trying to bend to adopt the geometry that it has in vivo, which is the geometry of the crypt. Um, so this led us to trying to understand what, are, what is the mechanism uh, that these cells are using uh, to bend. So now, of course, this model layer is trying to bend, but it's not bending because we're not allowing it to bend because the substrate is relatively stiff. So we reason that if we go to a much softer substrate or much stiffer substrate, then we should be seeing variations in the folding. So if you go to really stiff substrate, this is 15 kilopascal in X modulus, then the stem cell niche bulges out. But if you go to increasingly softer substrate, then you end up finding that the, this, this uh, starts adopting the actual shape of these organoids. Uh, so we can really recapitulate uh, the mechanisms that these cells are actually using in order to uh, fold uh, in vivo. And we can really tune and study how this changes as a function, for example, of the stiffness of the tissue that is surrounding this, this, this organoid. Okay, so then the, the question that we wanted to, to address uh, really is what is the, the what are the mechanisms that drive folding in the system? I mentioned some of those candidate mechanisms in my introduction. There's too many two, two main mechanisms that apply here. One is myosin differentials like apical constriction here. The other one is buckling is actually growth or through other mechanisms. Now to discern between these two mechanisms, uh, measuring traction forces is actually insufficient because uh, these two mechanisms give rise to a similar uh, traction patterns. But one thing you can do, of course, is to use the arsenal of tools in biology to uh, do loss of function uh, or, or gain of function. In this case, one interesting knob is to inhibit myosin with uh, bloody statin, and that's what we did here. When you inhibit myosin with bloody statin, all forces go away, as you see, as you see here, but also the monolayer flattens completely. So this is a folded monolayer. After bloody statin, the monolayer flattens uh, completely. So uh, this actually told us that the, the mechanism driving folding here uh, is actually myosin uh, dependent and not growth dependent. So this is not buckling driven by growth. So this is driven by actomyosin. So then one, what one should do is to look at actomyosin and that's what these statements are showing you with this uh, effectin, which accumulates at the apical surface of the cells. And it also accumulates in a ring in the basal surface of transit amplifying zone, which led us to two other mechanisms. One would be apical constriction by stem cells. The other would be basal compression by PA cells. So in other words, these cells that form this contractile ring, maybe they compress, and as they contract, they would compress the stem cell knees and that would cause the invagination of this ring. Um, um, so to discern between these two possibilities, what we did is uh, laser cuts. So we cut in different areas of this, uh, of this monolayer. And what we saw is that every time that we cut uh, circular segments anywhere in this monolayer, we always see uh, that the monolayer recalls. So what this told us is that these systems are under tension. These are the quantifications. So if the systems are under tension, what this implies 
is that uh, the system is not buckling because buckling would involve compression. Um, so these and uh, a lot more evidence that I don't have time to go through led us to the conclusion that uh, the stem cell niche falls through apical constriction of stem cell. Now we wanted to go uh, a bit uh, further. Uh, and so what we wanted to do here is to not only understand the mechanism folding, but also we asked whether we were able to predict, to explain the shape of every single cell in this organism. And for that, we joined forces with theorists, uh, with uh, Francesco Greco and Marino Arroyo at the UPC, who developed a 3D vertex model. And essentially what they can do in the model is they can prescribe uh, arbitrary tension to any surface of the cells. And then they can observe what is the consequence of that increase or decrease in tension in the shape of the monolayer. Um, so what we did is we prescribe tension that will be proportional to the amount of actin, of cortical actin that we measure. So there's an accumulation of actin in the apical surface of the stem cell niche and accumulation of actin in the basal surface of uh, the transit amplifying chain. Then they couple these monolayers to a soft substrate and then they make a prediction of the shape uh, that this monolayer would have with simply imposing tensions that are proportional to the amount of actin that we're experimentally measuring. Then Maria Matejic in the lab uh, took uh, these predictions for the models and she compared them to uh, a segmented, uh, to several segmented uh, monolayers. And what she found is that these model predictions were very closely matched by the data. So the stem cell niche on a stiff substrate is taller, cells are tilted towards the center of the stem cell niche. Then they undergo this banana shape in the transit amplifying zone and then they turn to boulder. Uh, she was also able to analyze uh, the same condition on soft uh, substrate. And again, she was able to map very closely the prediction of the model to the actual data. And there's actually very little tweaking of the model. In fact, uh, the harder we tweak the model, the worse the predictions were. So this is really uh, a very crude uh, uh, model that resembled very closely uh, our data. So Maria, of course, uh, did that very carefully, quantitatively, uh, and, and, and she found a very good match. Uh, we were also able to predict not only the shapes of the cells, but also the structural forces. So the structural forces uh, predicted by the model, and this is the component that we measured experimentally. So it's very close. Okay, so with that, I will just uh, wrap up and go to uh, the conclusions. So we have these intestinal, or intestinal organoids that exhibit a new monotonic stress distribution that defines mechanical and functional compartments. We concluded that the stem cell compartment pushes the extracellular matrix and falls through apical constriction, whereas the transit amplifying zone pulls the ECM and elongates the basal constriction. Uh, the shape and force distribution of the pit can be largely explained by cell surface tensions following the measured apical and basal atomizing density there. Um, this conclusion I didn't tell you about. We also studied the whole migration process of cells. If you're interested in this, uh, you can read the bioarchives uh, paper or watch uh, the extended version of this talk on YouTube. And finally, and importantly, uh, this is the first, uh, the first uh, study in which we could measure the mechanobiology of the forces uh, uh, that cells exert uh, in, uh, in any type of organoid with single cell resolution. So we think that now the mechanobiology of organoids is now amenable to experimental observation and we're very excited to, to, to work on this. Uh, finally, we'd like to acknowledge uh, folks in the lab. Uh, these three guys here, Carlos and Gerardo drove the project. Uh, Manu uh, is our computer guy. He, he developed a lot of the technology that I told you about. Maria uh, with the segmentation of, of the data. Uh, collaborators, Marino's group, Daniela's group, uh, Eduard Valle's group at IRB, and Pera Cusacs uh, at IBEC. Uh, our funders uh, recently got a near seed funds grant for this study in January, so we're looking for partners and PhD positions. If you're interested, drop me an email, meet me now uh, at the uh, meet the speaker uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chavi. That was an amazing talk. Um, so. I will start with the question uh, because there's a delay between the basically the, our live here and the streaming. So I will let the participants uh, drop in questions uh, in the chat. You have to go to the stage chat and then find the Spalm organizer, organizer and drop a question there and they will uh, forward to us. Um, so basically one, one question would be, I mean, it's kind of obvious, but uh, how, how easy is, is it going to be in the next years or maybe you're doing it already? Um, to sort of introduce uh, biomedicine in this model? Like, could you really test a uh, disease, for example, like colon cancer, uh, in this in vitro system that recapitulates uh, the 3D mechanics of these, uh, these villi? 
Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so, so there's different things one can do. So first thing is that these, these organizations are very accessible, more than the closed organizing, which you cannot access the lumen, which isn't physiological. So here we could study many diseases, for example, uh, um, and in fact, we were contacted by a group who was interested in our protocol to test, uh, to screen for COVID drugs because uh, these, uh, these, these organoids can be infected by COVID. And this is very accessible. You can screen quickly uh, many, many, many drugs. Uh, you can also induce mutations selectively in these cells, mutations associated with colon cancer. We're doing that with, with Edu Valia uh, at IRB. Um, and you can throw there, uh, I mean, you can take organoids with increased compound uh, mutations and then study how form shape is related, how these grow. You can add stroma. So you can really take this very simple uh, approach and then start building up on that. And, and, and then it's interesting because you can start seeing, for example, how this very stereotypic shape is derailed as soon as you start introducing mutations to this patient. So I think there's, there's a lot of stuff that we can do in the future in that sense. Okay. So uh, there's one question from the audience. Uh, I apologize, I don't have the name of the person, so I cannot like uh, forward it. The question is, during the formation of the crypt, are there any differences in lipid composition in cells or the regions of the crypt? Uh, and a sub question would be is cholesterol or does cholesterol have a role in the stiffness or stabilizing structures and shapes? So, we, we haven't looked at membrane in the system. We have studied membrane in other systems, not in this one. Um, so, so, here what we were able to find is that uh, the, the main driver here is actomyosin. And if you, if you want, it, this is very simple, right? Because the uh, if we know the amount of actin and myosin, fact of actin in the context of the cells, we can predict everything, every shape, every like the, the, the entire folding, right? And this, is, I mean, to me, is remarkable because these are different cell types. There's lots of complicated factors, and the, the answer is very simple: all you need is the core. Of course, the the, the actin cortex is influenced by the membrane, right? There's this continuous cross flow between membrane and and, and cortex. So. I wouldn't be surprised that there's lots of, uh, I don't know if it's about the composition of the membrane or about the signal uh, receptors in that membrane, but surely there will be cross talk that might be regulating this, uh, uh, this active cortex density. Okay. Um, so now there are some questions coming in the chat, so I can read them easily. Can you tell a bit about quantification of these forces? Do you need complex fitting and math models, or can you just read out displacement of the beads? That's a question from T.C. Allen. Right. Um, so, so these bits, they form, a, a, they form, a, a, it's a monolayer of bits. They are 200 nanometers, 100 nanometers. So uh, you usually don't track them individually. We run PIV. And I, with this, I think we got pretty good at getting really good high resolution PIV. And this is very important. Uh, and then there's a, the problem of inverting uh, this, uh, this field into a force field uh, is Mechanically, it's a bit complicated. It's very sensitive to noise. It's a, it's an ill-posed problem. There are there is one plugin, an image plugin that allows you to be, to do that, uh, especially for single cells or cells that are isolated, um, with decent resolution, I would say. Um, um, we're trying to make our system as robust as possible to sort of put it out there and so anyone can use it. But it's not it's not completely trivial, especially in in 3D. But uh, if you're interested in just looking at one cell. Uh, on a flat substrate, then there's a good uh, image J plugin that can, can get you there. Okay. I will take another two questions and then we will move to the next session. So um, one is from Miran Sugonde. Um, could you comment on the advantages of using optical microscopy over atomic force microscopy to study mechanical forces of your model? Right. Um, well, uh, it, it depends on, on, on what your question is. Here we want to monitor uh, cells for a long time. We're interested in the basal surface, so the force that they exert at the interface between the cell and the substrate. So this is not accessible to AFM. Of course, it's very interesting to study the surface, the apical surface of the cell and how stiff they are. And for that, we have actually done some preliminary studies with, with AFM. Uh, there's issues, for example, some of these are secret mucus. I mean, that's uh, what uh, cells do impart in, in your in your gut. 
And that AFM becomes, uh, I mean, you can study the mockers, but you cannot really study the mechanics of the cell because of, uh, it's, 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 it's messy, right? So it is compatible. I think it's very important to know, for example, how stiff, how stiff, in fact, we can do we can do the two things. We can measure forces at the basal surface with calcium microscopy and at the apical surface with AFM. This is stuff that we, that we can do, but uh, the surface of the cell, because they are ciliated, because they secrete all sorts of stuff, uh, is not so easy to access. Okay, thank you. Then maybe a final question would be, so I think it's a bit general, uh, maybe you can, you want to refocus. Um, could you tell us more about the equipment and setup you're using? So I suppose like, uh, you know, microscopy and beyond in the lab, what is the, the panel of right. techniques that you're using or will use in the future? Yeah, yeah, it's a very good uh, question. Um, so, so most of what I showed you was spinning this. So in this case, it was a w, w1. Uh, um, uh, we also use uh, ARIS, ARIS scan, so this is uh, inverted uh, confocal microscopy. Um, there's a problem, which is that we have to image through a gel, and this gel is 50, 100 microns thick, and there's beads in it, so there's scattering there. So this uh, is the reason why the images look like they, they look. In fact, I was presenting this uh, once in a conference, and someone asked me, uh, how come your images are so poor? <laughs> and I said, well, because I have to image through a gel. So now we're turning to, to light sheets uh, imaging from the top. So with the uh, VI spin configuration, so we're, we're, I mean, part of this advanced grant that I mentioned will be to try to do instruction microscopy in these systems, uh, looking from the top. So we'll see how that works, whether there are lensing effects, we, we will see. Um, but uh, of course, we will get much better images of the cells uh, with that. But so far, for, for what I showed you, there's nothing fancy at all. At all. OK. Thank you very much, Xavi. That was really amazing. Um, Thank you. So for those who would like to talk with Xavi, then he will be in the Meet the Speaker session that you can find in Hopin. It's one of the parallel sessions, and it's going to be after this session, and we're going to go together there. Okay. So I hand in to 